So our reading for today is Luke 10, 25 to 11:36, And it's actually fairly short as far as our Luke readings go, so savor it. But we've tried to do the reading a number of different ways. And I always try to make each Sunday a little bit different, to, to try and do the reading in a different way. And someone came to me and said, why don't you just read it all the way through? And I realized I hadn't actually done that yet. So today, you get to hear the unit as a whole, which I think is important because you get to see these pieces. You get to make these connections yourself and see the reason why these texts are together. Kind of the way we've read the Bible over the years with picking bits and pieces all the time is that we kind of feel like a lot of the Bible passage was put together at random, but there is really a method to the madness, and this is a fairly clear week. At least it is in my brain, uh, and a few people tend to agree with what's in my brain, so uh, you can see if it's clear to you as well. But our reading begins on page 54 in our New Testament, if you'd like to follow along. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to them, you've given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side of the road. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side of the road. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go, and do likewise. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to a time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And the man answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find, knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, 
And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give them a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will you give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Now He was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, kept demanding from him a higher sign from heaven. But he knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself becomes a desert, and house falls on house. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out the demons by Beelzebub. Now if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by who do your exorcists cast them out? Therefore, therefore they will be your judges. But if, it, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man fully armed guards his castle, his property is safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he was trusted and divides his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through the waterless regions looking for a resting place but not finding any, it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it sweat and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. While he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. When the crowd was increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It asked for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise with the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. Because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and see something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up against the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah and see something greater than Jonah is here. And now our last small bit. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it's not healthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when a lamp gives you light with its rays. This is our good news for this day. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Maybe it's because I'm living with a baby and a toddler these days. <laughs> but when I hear about the mute demon in our gospel, I think, that's not such a bad demon. <laughs> Jesus drives out this mute demon, and my third, first thought was, hey, Jesus, let's not be so hasty here. <laughs> let's enjoy this quiet while we can. <laughs> But then I remember another truth about toddlers, and it's this. Silence is golden, but with a toddler, silence is suspicious. <laughs> we all know the ways we can quietly get ourselves in trouble, and sometimes the silent troubles are far more toxic than the vocal ones. But why did Jesus cast out the mute demon? 
I mean, don't get me wrong. We know casting out demons is kind of Jesus' thing. But why specifically a mute demon? To get into this, we've got to look at our other passages in this section. And why they show us that something that robs us of our voice is particularly problematic. Our first story, the first part of the reading, it's a story you all know fairly well. The Good Samaritan story. Most of you could get up here and act it out. I mean, most of you wouldn't, but you could get up here and act it out. And the first thing I have to say about this story, the first thing I have to say about voice, is that our voice is not always used in words. More often than not, we do our main bit of speaking by our action. Because people can see what we really mean by what we actually do. And the voice of the priest and Levite, the ones who passed on the other side of the road, is stifled by what society and the world told them that they had to do. To them, the world was about remaining clean, remaining unspoiled. And who knows what that man in the ditch did to deserve the beating that he got. That was the thinking of the day. But the Samaritan shows up. And he's already considered staying by the house of Israel. Because when the Babylonians came and conquered the house of Israel and took them into captivity, those that stayed in Jerusalem were the Samaritans. And to survive, they intermarried. Which means that they became unclean. To even touch them was to make you unclean. So seeing a man in a ditch, the good Samaritan's mind wasn't clouded by what could I catch. But instead his voice gets to ring out. It's not right for someone to die in a ditch alone. And so we have verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And our world is changed by his voice because we realize exactly who our neighbor is. Everyone. And how we're supposed to act toward that neighbor. And then we get to Martha in verse 40, who falls under the category of busy doing nothing. And she's found herself trapped in this sea of nothing. It's a person you know. That person that can never sit still. That can never be done with the task. Is always working and working and exhausted and exhausted. Let me hear about it. Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Her voice carried the weight of maintaining. Of keeping others trapped in this never-ending cycle of work. But there are times when we need to stop. Times when we need to rest at the feet of Jesus and look up at the heavens and wonder why. What does it mean? When we sit and stare up at those heavens, we find ourselves wanting to say something to God and we go to say the words and nothing comes out. We don't think we know how to pray, at least not in the right way. So we stop ourselves from offering those words to God, the words that God is waiting to hear. We stop ourselves from offering the prayers that can change the world. Jesus gives our voice to God, our words to God at the beginning. In verse 2 of chapter 11, he said to them, When you pray, say, and it's going to be hard for you to read this because your head will change it into the current Lord's Prayer. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. The beginning of prayer. Praising, hallowed be your name. Imploring, give us our daily bread. Forgiving as we are forgiven. Leading us away from 
from temptation. It's something we can add, add our voice to. It gives us the courage to speak to God. Then we have this great honest line in verse 7 about the reality of even friendship. And he answers the door from within, Do not bother me, the door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. My grandma always says, the squeaky wheel hits the grease. We just wish they'd stop squeaking. But they don't. And this brings us to our mute demon in verse 14. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed. I can only imagine what he said. I can only imagine the words that had been building in him over the years that he finally got out. I can only imagine the words that he shared in the years to come. The world loses something when we don't use our voice. And the thing that the world loses is not something that we normally realize. Because we don't often think about what it means to be sons and daughters of God. Your voice is no longer your own. You get to speak with the voice of God. Which brings me to the title of this sermon, which you've been probably wondering about if you are a bulletin checker before the service. <laughs> Metatron. Sounds like a transformer, but it's not. Maybe it is, but it, that's not what this is about. It's more than that. There's a lot of myth and legend about the Metatron. But I want to show you a clip about the Metatron. And in this case, he is played by Alan Rickman. Which, if you're a little more old school, you might know him as Hans from Die Hard. But if you're a little more new school, you'll know him as Snake from Harry Potter. But to me, he will always be the Metatron in the movie Dog Man. He appears in this woman's bedroom. And she, of course, because he appears in a tongue of fire, she uses a fire extinguisher on him. And after he's calmed down, he decides to walk her through who the Metatron is and what he does. And he does it as only Alan Rickman can, in a way that's incredibly relevant for us today. same voice, the very voice of God. No, it doesn't mean you'll suddenly have an English accent like Alan Rickman. And no, it doesn't mean you'll never get things wrong. And no, it doesn't mean your words will only be words and not also your actions. But within us, 
within each and every one of us is a voice capable of changing the direction of the world around you. Not always in big, explosive ways where you have theme music and everything, but especially in little moments, because those tend to be the moments that God works through. And Luke is trying to tell us, time and again trying to tell us to not let world, the world or society stifle your voice like it did the priest and the Levite. To not let the little things of life, the tasks, the chores, the endless lists, the headaches that get in our way, to not let them stand in the way of the bigger things. To not let not having the word or the belief or the faith in that moment get in the way of you offering the prayer or the action that this world most desperately needs. There are many things that try to rob us of our voice in this world. And when it happens, we tend to allow it because we think, who are we? What would we have even said in that moment? What would we have even done in that moment? But then the voice of God goes silent. When the sons and daughters of God go quiet, the world misses something. We leave the world on the other side of the road as we rush by to that place that we think we need to be. All the while, we're called to hear. We can't be silent. We can't remain mute. We must banish the things of our lives that are holding us back and allow ourselves to speak with the very voice of God. Amen.